Yo, what's going on guys? Dress Venture here, back at it with the next part of, uh, part two of the series, the William Lilly's history of his life and times from the year 1602 to 1618. First video was right before this. So now I am going to be getting into the next part. which is of Dr. Simon Foreman. He was a Chandler's son in the city of Westminster. He traveled to Ho into Holland for a month in 1580, purposely to be instructed in astrology and other more occult sciences, uh, as also in physique, taking his degree of Dr. Beyond Seas, being sufficiently furnished and instructed with what he desired. He returned into England towards the la later end of the latter end of the reign of Queen Elizabeth and flourished until the year of King James, wherein the Countess of uh, Essex, the Earl of Somerset, and Sir Thomas Overbury's matters were questioned. He lived in Lambeth with a very good rapport of the neighborhood, especially of the poor, and to whom he was very charitable. He was a person that in orary questions, orary questions, especially thefts, was very judi judi judicious and fortunate. So also in sickness, which indeed was his masterpiece. In resolving questions about marriage, he had good success, and other questions very moderate. He was a person of indefatigable pains. I have seen sometimes half one sheet of paper wrote of his judgment upon one question, uh, in writing whereof he used much uh, tautology, as you may see yourself, most excellent Esquire. If you read a great book of Dr. Floods, of Dr. Floods, or Floods, which you have, who had all that book from the manuscripts of Foreman, for I have seen the word for word in an English manuscript formerly belonging to Dr. Willoughby of Gloucester had Foreman lived to have methodized his own papers, I doubt not, but he would have advanced the, the itro, itro ma mathematical part thereof very completely. For he was very observant and kept notes of the success of his judgments, as in many of his figures I have observed. I very well remember to have read in one of his manuscripts what followeth. Being in bed one morning, he says, I was desirous to know whether I should ever be a lord, earl, or knight, and whereupon I set a figure, and thereupon my judgment, by which he concluded that within two years' time he should be a lord or great man. But, says he, before the two years were expired, the doctors put me in Newgate and nothing came not long after he was desirous to know the same things concerning this honor or great ship, another figure was set and that promised him to be a great lord within one year. But he sets down that in that year he had no preferment at all, only I became acquainted with a merchant's wife by whom I got well. There is another concerning one, sir, ire his going into Turkey, whether it would be a good voyage or not. The doctor repeats all his astrological reasons and musters them together and then gave his judgment. It would be a fortunate voyage, but under this figure, he concludes, this proved not so, for he was taken prisoner by pirates ere he arrived in Turkey and lost all. He set several questions to know if he should obtain the philosopher's stone, and the figures according to his straining did seem to signify as much. And then he tugs upon the aspects and configurations and elected a fit time to begin his operation. But by and by, in conclusion, he adds, so the work went very forward, but upon the square of uh, conjunction, the setting glass broke and I lost all my pains. He set down five or six such judgments, but still complains all came to nothing. Upon the malignant aspect of Saturn... And Mars, although some of his astrological judgments did fail, more particularly those concerning himself, 
uh, he being no way capable of such prefer preferment as he ambitiously desired. Yet I shall repeat some other of his judgments which did not fail, being performed by conference with spirits. My mistress once, uh, my mistress went once unto him to know when her husband, then in Cumberland, would return, he having promised to be at home near the time of the question. After some consideration, he told her to this effect, Marjorie, for so her name was, uh, Marjorie, for so her name was, thy husband will not be at home these eighteen days. His kindred have vexed him, and he has come away from thee in much anger. Uh, he is now in Carl, Carlisle, and hath but three pence in his purse. And when he came home, he confessed all to be true, and that upon leaving his kindred, uh, kindred, he had but three pence in his purse. I shall relate one story more, and then his death. One Coleman clerk to Sir Thomas Beaumont of Leicestershire, having had some liberal favors both from his lady and her neighbors bragged of it the, and the knight brought him into the star chamber had his servant sentenced to be uh pilloried whipped and afterward during life to be imprisoned the sentence was executed in london and was to be in leicestershire two keepers were to convey coleman from fleet to Leic uh, leicester my mistress, taking consideration of Coleman and the miseries he was to suffer, went presently to Foreman, acquainted him therewith, who, after consideration, swore Coleman had lain both with mother and daughters, and besides said that the old lady, being afflicted with fits of the mother, called him into her chamber to hold down the fits with his hands, and that he, holding his hands about the breast, she cried, Lower, lower, and put his hands below her belly, and then he also told my mistress in which and what posture he lay in with the young ladies and said and said they intend in Leic in Leicester to whip him to death. But I assure thee, Marjorie, he shall never come there, yet they set forward to morrow, he says. And so and so his his two keepers did, Coleman's leg being locked with an iron chain under the horse's belly. In this nature they travelled the first and second day on the third day the two keepers seeing their prisoner's civility the two preceding days did not lock his chain under the horse's belly as formerly but locked it only to one side in this posture they rode some miles beyond northampton uh northampton when on a sudden one of the keepers had a necess uh, necessity to untruss and so the other and coleman stood still by and by the other keeper desired coleman to hold his horse uh, for he had occasioned also Coleman immediately took one of their swords and ran through two of the horses, killing them dead star, uh, stark dead, gets upon the other with one of their swords. Farewell, gentlemen, quoth he. Uh, Tell my master I have no mind to be whipped in Leicestershire, and so went his way. The two keepers in all haste went to a gentleman's house near at hand, complaining of their misfortune and desired of him to pursue their prisoner, which he with much civility granted. But ere the horses could be got ready, the mistress uh, of the house came down and inquiring what the matter was, went to the stable and commanded the horses to be unsaddled with a sharp speech. With this sharp speech, let the lady uh, Beaumont and her daughters live honestly. None of my horses shall go forth upon this occasion. I could relate many such stories of his performances, as also what he wrote in a book left him uh, left behind him is. This I made the devil write with his own hand in Lambeth Fields, 1596, or in June or July, as I now remember. He professed to his wife that there would be much trouble about Carr and the Countess of Essex, who frequently restor uh, resorted unto him, and, who, and from whose company he would sometimes lock himself in his study a whole day. Now we come to his death, which happened as follows. The Sunday night before he died, his wife and he being at supper in their garden house, she being pleasant, told him that she had been informed he could resolve uh, whether man or wife should die first. Whether shall I, quoth she, bury you or no? O Trunco, for so he called her, thou wilt bury me, but thou wilt much repent it. Yea, 
but how long? Yeah, but how long? I shall die. He said, air Thursday night. Monday came, all was well. Tuesday came, he was not sick. Wednesday came, and he was all well, which with which his impertinent imper- wife did much twit him in his teeth. Thursday came, and dinner was ended. He was very well. He went down to the waterside and took a pair of oars to go to the building, to some building, where uh, he was in the hand with in, pa- in paddle dock. Let me say that again. He went down to the waterside and took a pair of oars to go to some buildings he was in hand with in paddle dock. Being in the middle of the Thames, he presently fell down, only saying, in impo- an impost, an impost, and so died. A most sad storm of wind immediately following, he died worth 1,200 pounds and left only one son called Clement. All his rarities, secret manuscripts of what quality soever Dr. Naper of Linford in Buckinghamshire had, who had been a long time his scholar and of whom Foreman was used to say he would be a a dunce. Yet in continuance of time, he proved a singular astrologer and physician. Sir Richard, now living, I believe, has all those rarities in possession, which were foreman's being kinsman and heir unto Dr. Napper's. His son, Thomas Napper, Esquire, ESQ, most generously gave most of these manuscripts to Elias Ashmole, ESQ. I hope you will pardon this digression. So I guess, uh, yeah, I think that that's a pretty interesting concept to hear how some of these philosophers were handed down certain manuscripts from people over time. Going back into the text. After my mistress was dead, I lived most comfortably, my master having a great affection for me. The year 1625 now comes on, and the plague exceedingly violent. I will relate what I observed the spring before it broke forth. Against our corner house, every night there would come down about five or six of the clock, sometime 100 or more boys playing, uh, some playing, others uh, as in a serious discourse, and just as it grew dark would all be gone home. Many succeeding years there is no such or any concourse, usually no more than four or five in, in a company. In the spring of 1625, the boys and the youths of several parishes in like number appeared again, which I beholding called Thomas Sanders, my landlord, and told him that the youth and young boys of several parishes did in that nature assemble and play in the beginning of the year 1625. God bless us, quoth I from the plague. Excuse me, guys. I from a plague this year, but then there succeeded one and the greatest that was uh, that, that ever was in London. In 1625, the visitation increasing and my master having a great charge of money and plate, some of his own, some of others of men's, left me and a fellow servant to keep the house and himself in June, went into Leicestershire. He was in that year a uh, fiofi collector for 12 poor alms people living in Clement Dane's churchyard, whose pensions I, in his absence, paid weekly to his and the parish's great satisfaction. My master was no sooner gone down, but I bought a, a, a bass viola, um, a bass viol, and got a master to instruct me. The intervals of time I spent in bowling in Lincoln's infields with Watt the cobbler, Dick the, the blacksmith, and such like companions. We have sometimes been at our work at six in the morning, and so continued till three or four in the afternoon, many times without bread or drink all that time. Sometimes I went to church and heard funeral sermons, of which there was then great plenty. At other times I went early to St. Atheline's in London, where there were every morning a sermon. The most able people of the whole city and suburbs were out of town, if any remained, it were such as were engaged by parish officers to remain. No habit of a gentleman or gentlewoman continued. The woeful calamity of that year was grievous. People dying in the open fields and in open street, 
at last in August, the bills of morality so increased so that very few people had thoughts of surviving the contagion. The Sunday before the great bill came forth, which was of 5,000 and odd hundreds, there was appointed a sacrament at Clement Danes. During the distribution, whereof I do very well remember, we sang 13 parts of 119th of the 119th Psalm. One Jacob, our minister, for we had three that day, the communion was so great, fell sick as he was giving the sacrament, went home and was buried of the plague the Thursday morning. Mr. James, another of the ministers, fell sick ere he had quite finished, had the plague, and was 13 weeks ere before he recovered. Um, Mr. Whitaker, the last of the three, escaped not only then, but all the contagion following, without any sickness at all, though he officiated at every funeral and buried all manner of people, whether they died of the plague or not. He was given to drink seldom could preach more than one quarter of an hour at a time in november my master came home my fellow servants in my diet came weekly to six shillings and six pence sometimes to seven shillings so cheap was diet at that time in february of that year my master married again one who hath one who after his death became my wife in the same year he settled upon me during my life, 20 pounds per annum, which I have enjoyed ever since, even to the writing thereof. May 22nd, 1627, my master died at the corner house in the Strand, where I also lived so long. He died interstate, interstate, my mistress relinquishing the administration. It came to his elder brother, who assigned the estate over to me for payment of my master's debts, which being paid, I faithfully returned the remaining part unto his administrator, nor had one penny of the estate more than 20 pounds per annum, which was allowed to me by contract to undertake the payment of my master's debts. Very interesting to hear how uh, stuff like that happened back in the day. Cool. 20 pounds per annum. That's wild. Okay. So we're going to get into of my marriage the first time and how I came into astrology. Uh, that's going to be like, uh, I don't know how much into that one I'm going to be able to get into is a long one. And that's pretty much where it keeps going from there. So we're going to start with that and then we're going to get the marriage, get into the astrology and then stop there in a little bit. Of my marriage the first time, my mistress, who had been twice married to old men, was now resolved to be uh, cousined no more. She was of a brown, rudy complexion, corpulent, of but mean stature, plain, no education, yet a very provident person, and of good condition. She had many suitors, old men, whom she declined, some gentlemen of decayed fortunes, whom she liked not, for she was not covetous and sparing. By my fellow servant, she was obsessed frequently to say she cared not if she married a man that would love her, so that he had never, so that he had never a penny, and would ordinarily talk of me when she gave when she was in bed. And by my fellow servant, she was observed frequently to say she cared not if she married a man that would love her so that he had never a penny, so he had never a penny, and would ordinarily talk of me when she was in bed. This servant gave me encouragement to give the on, to give the onset. I was much perplexed hereat, for should I attempt her and be slighted, she would never care for me afterwards. But again, I considered that if I should attempt and fail, she would never speak of it, or would any believe I durst so be so uh, audacious as to propound such a question. The disproportion, uh, the, dispro the disproportion of the years and fortune being so great betwixt us, however, all her talk was of husbands and my presence, saying one day after dinner, she respected not wealth, but desired an honest man. I made answer, I thought I could fit her with such a husband. She asked me where. I made no more ado, but presently saluted her and told her myself was the man. She replied, I was too young. I said, nay, what I had not in wealth I would supply in love, and saluted her frequently, which she accepted lovingly. 
and the next day at dinner made me sit down at dinner with my hat on my head and said she intended to make me her husband, for which I, ha I gave her many salutes. And I was very careful to keep all things secret, for I well knew if she should take counsel of any friend, my hopes would be frustrated. Therefore, I suddenly procured her consent to marry, until which she assented, so that upon the eighth day of September 1627 at George's Church in Southwark, I was married unto her, and for two whole years we kept it secret. When it was divulged, and some people blamed her for it, she constantly replied that she had no kindred. If I proved kind and a good husband, she would make me a man. If I proved otherwise, she only, did, um, she only undid herself. In the third and fourth year after our marriage, we had strong suits of law with her first husband's kindred, but overthrew them in the end. During all of the time of her life, which was until October 16, uh, 1633, we lived very lovingly. I, frequent, I, frequently, I frequenting no company at all, my exercises were sometimes angling in which I ever delighted. My companions, two aged men, I then frequently lectured two or three in a week. I heard Mr. Soot in Lombard Street, Mr. Uh, Goge of Black uh, Friars, Fryar, Dr. Micklethwaite of the Temple, Dr. Oldsworth with others, the most learned men of these times, and leaned in judgment to Puritanism. In October 1627, I was made free of the Salter's Company in London. So that's very interesting um, of just how things kind of came together for him and uh, you know just uh, how you know his life you know and, and how it's came together and him learning astrology him just the mistress and just it's fascinating for me I guess why to learn about these people's lives because I'm very much into William Willie's uh, you know, vibe, energy, his uh, viewpoints on and interpretations on astrology. And I think by getting to know him on a level, like getting to know his life and getting to know his, you know, his journey, it allows me and I think for other people to get an insight more into who, who he is and his work and really getting to know what he means when he says certain things. So um, blessings to you, William. Let's get into this and uh, we're going to do a couple more minutes. And uh, this is where it gets to start, I think, cool, when he starts to learn about astrology. So it says, how I came to study astrology. It happened on one Sunday, 1632, as myself and a justice of peace's clerk were, before service, discoursing of many things. He chanced to say that such a person was a great scholar, nay, so learned that his could make an almanac, which to me was then strange, to me then was strange. One speech begot another till, at last, he said he could bring me acquainted with one Evans in Gunpowder Alley, who had formerly lived in Staffordshire. That was an excellent wise man and studied in the black art. The same week after, we went to see Mr. Evans. When we came, we came to his house, he, having been drunk the night before, was upon, was upon his bed. If it be lawful to call that a bed whereon he then lay, he rused up himself, and then, after some compliments, he was content to instruct me in astrology. I intended his best opportunities for seven or eight weeks, in which time I could set a perfect fi uh, uh, figure perfectly. Books he had not any, except a uh, holiday judicis astrum and originus uh, eph ephemerides. He did it in Latin, so it's hard for me to say. So that as often as I entered his house, I thought I was in the wilderness. Now something of the man. He was by birth a Welshman, a master of arts, and in sacred orders. He had formerly... He had formerly had a cure of souls in uh, Staffordshire, but now was coming was come to try his fortunes at London, being in a manner enforced to fly for some offenses very scandalous, committed by him in these parts where he had lately lived, for he gave judgment upon things lost, the only shame of astrology. He was the most Saturnian or Saturnian person my eyes ever beheld either before I practice or since, of a middle stature, broad forehead, beetle-brown, thick-shouldered, flat nose, full-lipped, down-looked, 
black curling, stiff hair, splay footed to give him his right. He had the most piercing judgment naturally upon a figure of theft and many other questions that I had I ever met with all. Yet for money, he would willingly give contrary judgments, was much addicted to debauchery, and then very abusive and quarrelsome. Seldom without a black eye or one mischief of, an, of other. <laughs> this is the same Evans who made so many uh, anti mortal cups, which upon the sale whereof he principally subsisted. Uh, he understood Latin very well in the Greek tongue, not at all. He had some arts above and beyond astrology, for he was very well versed in the nature of spirits, and had many times used the circular way of invocating, as in the time of our familiarity, he told me. Two of his actions I will relate as to me delivered. There was in Staffordshire a young gentlewoman that had for her uh, preferment went married an aged rich person, who was desirous to purchase some lands for his wife's maintenance. But this young gentlewoman, his wife, was desired to buy the land in the name of a gentleman, her very dear friend, but for her use. After the aged man was dead, the widow could by no means procure the deeds of the purchase of purchase from her friend, uh, whereupon she applies herself to Evans, who, for a sum of money, promises to have her deeds safely delivered into her own hands. The sum was forty pounds. Evans applied himself to the invocation of the angel Solomon of the nature of Mars, read his litany in the common prayer book every day at the selected hour, wears his surplice, lives orderly all that time. At that fortnight, at the fortnight's end, uh, Solomon appeared, and having received his commands what to do, in a small time returns with the very deed desired, lays it down gently upon a table where the white cloth was where a white cloth was spread, and then being dismissed, vanished. The deed was by the gentleman who formerly kept it placed among many other of his evidences in a large wooden chest in a chamber at one end of the house. But upon Solomon's receipt, removing and bringing away the deed, all that bay of building was quite blown down, and all his own proper evidences torn all to pieces. The second story followeth. Some time before I became acquainted with him, he was then living in uh, Minories, was desired to buy the Lord Bothwell and Sir Kenelm Digby to show them a spirit. He promised to do so to do. The time came, and they were all in the body of the circle, when, lo, upon a sudden, after, uh, upon a sudden, after some time of in invocation, Evans was taken out of the room and carried into the field near Battersea Causeway, um, Causeway close to the Thames. Next morning, a countryman, going by to his labor and espying a man in black clothes, uh, cloths came unto him and awakened him and, and asked him how far he came there. Evans by this understood his condition and inquired where he was, how far was London, and in what parish he was. Until which, until, which when he understood, he told the laborer he had been late at Battersea the night before and by chance was left there by his friends. Sir Kenelm, Kenelm Digby and then Lord Bothwell went home without any harm and came uh, and came next day to hear what had become, what was become of him. Just as they in the afternoon came into the house, a messenger came from Evans to his wife and to and, and come to at Batter, come to him at Battersea. I inquired upon what account the spirit carried him away, who said he had not at the time of the invocation made any uh, suffumigation at which the spirits were vexed. It happened that after I discerned what astrology was, I went weekly into Little Britain and bought many books of astrology, not acquainting Evans therewith, not acquainting Evans therewith. Mr. A. Bedwell, minister of Tottingham, uh, High Cross near London, who had met, been many times, uh, who had been many years chaplain to Sir Henry Watton, while Sir Henry Watton, while he, while he was ambassador at Venice, assisted Pietro Solve Polano in composing and writing the Council of Trent, wow, which uh, was lately dead, and his library was being sold into Little Britain. 
I bought amongst them my choices books of astrology. The occasion of our falling out was thus. A woman demanded the resolution of a question, which when he had done, which when he had done, she went her way. I, standing by all the while and observing the figure, asked him why he gave the judgment he did, since the signification showed quite the contrary, and gave him my reason, which when he had pondered, he called me boy. You must, uh, he said, he called me boy, and must he be contradicted by such a novice? But when his heat was over, he said, had he not so judged to please the woman, she would had given him nothing, and he had a wife and family to provide for. Upon this, we never came together after. Being now very meanly introduced, I applied myself to study those books I had obtained many times 12 or 15 or 18 hours a day and night. <laughs> Whoa. Being now very meanly introduced to the arts, I applied myself to study those books I obtained many times 12, 15, or 18 hours day or night. I was curious to discover whether there was any verity in the art or not. Astrology in this time, viz. in 1633, was very rare in London. Few professing it that understood anything thereof. Let it not represent you, O noble Esquire. If now I made a short digression of such persons as then professed astrology, that posterity may understand in what condition I found it, in whose hands that had little what, uh, that remained was lodged, in whose hands that little that remained was lodged. So he was saying, like, at that time, you know what I mean, people, barely anyone who, who knew astrology, anyone who was professing to know it, really only didn't, didn't really know that much. And like he was saying with, uh, Sir, um, with Mr. Evans, uh, he, at Mr. Evans, sounded kind of like a little, like, nutty. He was really good at some questions and, and determining certain figures. He was very bad at other ones, maybe in places that his own vices caused him to get fogged up, meaning that the interpretation of the astrologer is very much intimately connected to uh, the virtue that they possess and the clarity and clairvoyance that they can see into this stuff. Um, so let me just go for another uh, page and uh, I'm going to wrap things up. Uh, well, I think that's actually a great place to end it because um, then it goes on to another man. And I think that is, yeah, cool. He's saying he literally was studying astrology for 12 hours a day, if not more to really learn if there is any truth within the art. So I think that for inspiring astrologers, and definitely I am included in that, and just in this moment how I feel, I think that you got to just put your hours in, you got to put your time in, and um, slowly but surely it will start to connect more, and it will start to make more sense, and you'll be able to see. It's like in the Bible says, one, we now see in a dark in a in a like a dim or dark glass like cloud, cloudy glass but then we will see face to face you know you know pray for wisdom as um i've i've said heard many philosophers say in the past one being uh francis barrett and it will be provided um oh my gosh that's crazy but i think that the number one way of just being able to develop the understanding of the art is um is twofold one involves really learning how to uh, live the life being able to see how the different planetary aspects and the different signs really the resonate and in, in, um correspond into everyday nature and and life and I think secondary, it's to open yourselves up to the higher intelligences, the muses, uh, Urania, Isis, you know, the different intelligenistas that can provide the wisdom and knowledge necessary for you to understand. So I think that, you know, you can try. I think as like a buddy of mine told me, you can push on the door as hard as you want, but it won't open without the key. So sometimes the key is something that we have to ask the universe life for. And when we really desire something, you know, ask and you shall receive, knock and it shall be opened. Um, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> so anyways, I will see you guys in the next part where we will continue to go into talking about, um, yeah, his introduction into astrology and how he has developed into who he is. So 
starting to pick up a lot, and I'm excited to have you join for the next part. This is Jez Venture. Peace.